Hello, everybody. Welcome to Busting the Myth of Vendor Lock-In, how D2L embraced the lock and opened the cage. If that's what you're hoping for, you're in the right place. If it's not, stick around. We're going to have some fun. We are from D2L, or Desire to Learn. You know we're a fun company because we have a number in our name. We're an online learning company. What that means is that we help our customers, colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, government entities, bring their education online. Sometimes that's in a pure online play. Sometimes that's in a hybrid model where they might put their lectures online and free up classroom time to have an interactive experience. We really want to be a force multiplier for teachers. And if you think about it, we can really help. For the past couple hundred years, academia really hasn't changed how it teaches. So we can help inform the pedagogy or the science of teaching and live up to our mission statement, which is to transform the way the world learns. We want to bring education and knowledge not just to millions, but to billions. My name is Steven Skryslow. I've been with D12 for about 11 and a half years. I started as a tier three support. I moved on to run our deployment team who's responsible for getting our product both to on-premise clients as well as our own hosting facility. I transitioned to found an internal intelligence group that helps D2Lers make data-driven decisions. In the past year or two, I've been working on helping to redesign and re-architect our product to be cost-effective in the cloud. And a lot of what we're going to talk about here has that cost underlying concept behind it. Hi, everyone. My name is Stan Tchaikovsky. I have been at D2L for the past 18 months. I have been working primarily with our SaaS architecture team, really trying to make our current state infrastructure and platforms better, better being more performant, more cost effective, as well as more resilient, as well as helping to define, engineer, and implement what future state looks like. Over the past number of years, D2L has significantly transformed its infrastructure strategy and roadmap. In the last six months, we have firmed that up and converged on AWS as being our primary infrastructure and platform service provider. So the two of us are really, really excited to talk to you today about the concept of lock-in. I'm not going to bore you with too many definitions, but really lock-in to us is that feeling of fear, that feeling of being trapped, often by technology and architecture decisions we make, and the result in vulnerability often to factors outside of your control. What we discovered through our transformation is this is perfectly understandable. This is perfectly normal. We really see lock-in purely as a symbol or a byproduct of adopting services that you don't manage and that you don't own. We're going to be approaching today's discussion at a very high level in a very pragmatic fashion. We'll frame it up using examples of things we've done during our transformation and how lock-in has shaped that good and bad. And uh, yeah, good and bad. In each of those examples, we also step through the various iterations we went through as we improved our, our understanding of the consequence of our adoption, as well as the associated lock-in, and how we managed to rationalize the fear thereof. The very first thing just about anybody uses when they get to AWS is EC2. There's servers. Who's afraid of EC2? Pretty much no one. Why is that? We're going to get into that. This is generally a cloud lock-in type thing. There are two kinds of lock-in. There's where you're locking into cloud technologies, where going back to your on-premise environment wouldn't make sense. And then there's where you're locking into a vendor specifically, so using very specific AWS tech. So this is a usage curve. This is about 10 years of login data from our main product, Brightspace Learning Environment. With our system, logins are pretty much equivalent to the server needs we'd have at the application layer, which is pretty much equivalent to the cost needs to satisfy those servers. As I mentioned earlier, we're an edu company. That's why you see those spikes. Those are fall startups. That's when school's starting. You see the dips in the summer when most people are going home. And this is pretty standard across our product line. Now, that's not what we actually have in our servers and our hosting environments, nor what we actually pay for. We pay for much more. Why is that? Well, when we're provisioning ourselves, we have to have lead time because it takes six months to put through a purchase order and get the product in and rack and stack and get it all set up. We have to have buffer because if we're wrong, we're screwed because it's going to take six months to fix the problem. And we have to plan for the peaks because we can't turn off the machines, or rather, if we did, we're still paying for them, so there's no point. And I want you to remember the step function. Every time you see a step function on any cost curve that you graph, you are sad. The reason you're sad is because the difference between that step function and your actual usage is waste. And this is basically why AWS is great 101, 
because you only pay for what you use, you only use what you need. And that's not really what the talk is about, except part of it kind of is. The very first kind of lock-in you might do is to throw away that elasticity and use reserved instances. And that's what we did. So that green line is what our costs became when we used reserved instances. When you have predictable load, you've got peaks in your valleys, you can lock in for a year or three years into your servers. And what does that mean? That means we've locked in, vendor lock in for a year. It's not forever, it's not infinite. What we've done is say, we're willing to commit for one year. We do the cost calculation on that time horizon. One of the things you wanna think about with vendor lock-in is it's not a forever choice. You're trying to decide how long do you have to commit to make it be worth it. Interestingly, um, you don't actually wanna reserve just your trough. You wanna reserve slightly higher than that. You can do some statistical analysis to figure that out. If you wanna know more, you can talk to me afterwards. I'm married to a statistician, and she keeps me honest on things like this. Uh, but there's some cool math you can do to figure out what you should actually lock in at. So why is no one in this room afraid of vendor lock-in when we talk about EC2? Because we've been through that battle. About 10 or 15 years ago, the industry went through a transformation when we went from physical servers to virtual servers. And there was huge pushback. How will your database function if it's on a virtual machine? You're going to have performance problems. How are we going to keep the integrity of the data? We're going to have integrity issues. How am I going to make sure that I'm, I'm not leaking my my problems and my performance from VM to VM. But since that was a decade ago, most of us are pretty comfortable with the virtual machines at this point. The cloud is just the natural next step. It's the evolution where you go from physical to virtual and up to the cloud. So we've already paved that road. We've already paid that price. And what we want to convince you of is that other technologies are basically going through the same thing, and you should probably just get ahead of the curve. So what about those other things? Well, we have a content store. By that, I mean that our underlying files that serve up, so when a teacher is putting up a PowerPoint presentation, this is where they're going to put it, it uses a SIFS share. So we want to go slash slash and then a file name. We're moving to AWS. We went with the simplest possible solution. Our tag on this section is don't forget the tax. We're going to think about all the costs involved. Very first thing we did was DFSR. That's Distributed File System Replication. We had two servers across high availability zones. We ran M44Xs. We were fully provisioned with 12 terabytes of GP2 EBS storage. Why did we use general provisioning? Because when you get a volume big enough, you get 3,000 IOPS for free, for free in the sense that you've already paid for it. We didn't need dedicated provisioned IOPS. That was enough. Now, there's something familiar about this chart from a previous chart that I told you you should hate, which is a step function. We're wasting money, we're wasting storage, because we're paying for whatever we've allocated. It's pretty expensive and it's pretty inefficient. You'll note also there's a high minimum, and that really hurts when we have multi-region, because every region we go into, we're paying that minimum. So how can we get better? Well, we look at the marketplace. The marketplace is pretty cool, by the way. I think it's underutilized. Uh, the announcement a week or two ago, last Wednesday, um, about SaaS subscriptions is super interesting. What that means is that if you're coming from a HOFA environment, if you're coming from self-hosted, you can find those vendors that you're already using and use them in the cloud and have a seamless transition. And that's what we did. We found NetApp as a vendor that we're very comfortable with that we use in our own hosting environments, and we got their cloud offering. It's called ONTAP. We go from 12 terabytes to 50 terabyte nodes. We go from M44Xs to R32Xs. It's still fully provisioned, it's still GP2. I should note that I've used US East pricing on all this, but the chart axis would just change if you were on a different region. And we've gotten better. We're still a step function, but we're a smoother one, and our minimums have dropped a little. Another big advantage for us as we migrate from our hosted environment up is having NetApp on both sides makes replication trivial. So we've locked into this vendor that we're already locked into for other reasons, we're just locking in in another place. But that's still not good enough. What else can we do? Amazon has this thing called S3. It's pretty good. Our step function is gone. We've got a smooth curve now. And we're paying significantly less. Lower minimums. We're OK to go into any region. We don't care if we've got one client there or 1,000. We can still have reasonable costs. But there's an obvious gotcha there in that our product won't work, which is kind of a deal breaker. We'd have to change our system from SIFS shares to an object store. And this is where the dreaded lock-in kicks in. Won't anyone think of the children? 
So yes, let's think of them. In this case, our children are our developers. Some of them are in the front row, but I love my children. I love the developers, so we're all right. <laughs> we're going to have to change the product. Whatever will we do? The answer is math. Yay. You're not excited about math? I, I said I was married to a statistician, right? I'm excited about math. So what we're going to do is run the numbers. We're going to decide what's the break-even point. When do I feel good about locking into changing my product to only work in the cloud? I do an ROI calculation. That's return on investment. One note, you have to be very careful about your units. I turn everything into months because AWS, enough of their pricing is in months and enough is in hours that I just up everything in months and keep it simple. So I went to the dev team responsible for this effort and I made them give me an estimate. Back of the hand, how long is this going to take you? I cost that out, I put it on the top. On the bottom, I'm going to take my old method, what OPEX is per month, subtract my new method per month, and figure out if it's worth it. A couple gotchas, you want to watch out for your doubling time. There is a period of time where you're going to pay both the old way and the new way, and it sucks, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can make it more efficient, and practice it, and make that cut over time less, but you do have to account for that. The other thing you really want to account for is any tooling you're going to use. Often when you're shoehorning non-cloud tech into AWS, you're paying for something. You're paying some sort of conversion, some sort of scripting. You've invested a month to automate it. That should all count. You want to make sure to include all of those points. So in our particular case, we've got about a petabyte of storage in this content store. We figured out the dev time. We figured out the costs. And the answer was 11 months. As long as we're committing to 11 months, vendor lock-in for 11 months, good trade. We've changed our product, but as long as it's there for 11 months, good trade. And that's what you want to do. Instead of being afraid, should we lock in, should we not, you want to turn it around and say, how long am I committing to? If I change my mind two months from now, was this a good deal? No. If I change my mind 12 months from now, was this a good deal? Yeah. Fair trade. Why not EFS? So why not go deeper? We've gone from DFSR to NetApp in the marketplace, from NetApp in the marketplace to S3. Why not all the way to EFS? The answer is it's not right for us. Not every cloud tech is just automatically going to be perfect for you. EFS is too expensive for our needs. It's 30 cents a gig in US East, <coughs> and it's not good for this particular use. We're actually probably going to use it for some other things, but not this. And what you want to really look, on, look at is where are the tools that are going to work best for your needs? And even through all this, we're not really locked to AWS yet. This is an object store. Every cloud vendor for table stakes has an object store. We're going to lock in, because we're going to start using cool things like infrequent access or Glacier for long-term storage. Their data lifecycle management is very interesting. Because we're an edu company, some of our clientele really, really like to keep their courses that are 10 years old. Not many students are referencing them. It becomes fairly efficient from a cost point of view to put those on slower storage. So your levels of lock-in, we've locked into the cloud, not the vendor, and we determined that it was worth it. And we didn't have to invest our time in other areas. So as we continued throughout, you know, as we progressed through our transformation, it became quickly apparent that we would fundamentally have to change the way we thought about and approached technology. And often that meant deciding what to do versus not what to do. That is often a very, very, very difficult decision. And to assist us in making those, those decisions more quickly and more accurately, we established a couple of guidelines or tenets or guiding principles to help us along the way. The key one we came up with was do not, different, do not invest in things that do not differentiate you in your market. And our DNS and caching stories are both fantastic cases in point of this. As Stephen mentioned, D2L exists to transform the way the world learns. We do not exist to run great DNS platforms or great DNS platform services, and nor do we intend to. AWS, however, does. Yes, using Route 53 for DNS does mean that we're, lo we're locked in through the adoption. However, the benefits we get from not having to manage the DNS and all the complexities and the risk we introduce to our service, they far outweigh both the cost of getting there as well as the perceived cost of lock-in. I'd love to say that's where we started, but yeah, initially, in our first iteration, in AWS, we did roll our own DNS as we'd done in our own data centers. Not only was it expensive and complex, the risk it introduced was crazy. 
As you can see, the yellow line there is the cost. The majority of that was for a piece of software that we had. A piece of software that actually is pretty good at managing DNS. It gave us stuff like lifecycle management, workflow, an approval engine, control of DNS propagation, and all these really cool things. But what was actually interesting reflecting back is even though we had not established it at the time, we were actually inadvertently following that principle of not investing if it doesn't differentiate. Getting back to Route 53, yeah, a lot of those features, yeah, they're literally available to us at the click of a button. We get a lot of benefit with very little investment, thereby preserving that tenant. And I dare say, getting our, having our cake and eating it. To reiterate, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, D2L vision is to transform the way the world learns, not managing memcache clusters. Initially, we rolled our own memcached clusters. We worried about the, the scaling of it, the performance of it, the distribution, the tenancy, and all those things. Really, other than, once again, costly, risky, crazy expensive. So after some research and some prototyping, we decided to use the last cache as our caching, to help us with our caching platform. What was interesting, looking back, is the actual lock-in or the cost of adopting that service really was just an endpoint change on application configuration. It was that easy. I often joke, and I'm not actually joking, it took us longer to fill out the paperwork to actually make that happen, all the subsequent meetings we had to have to, to prove to everyone this is a good idea, than actually doing the change itself. So why is this? Why is this such a good thing? This is a little trivial, it's a little arbitrary, but it's fun nonetheless. We Googled around for employee accounts. We tried to find some accounts for AWS, we couldn't, so we had to settle on, on Amazon's accounts. And when we compared that to our own, what we found is for every one DNS expert we could conceivably have, or memcache expert, Amazon AWS could have 300. Taking that into account and considering that Amazon is in the business of offering platform services, they're always gonna be better. Better means we're gonna get features quicker, they're gonna be offered in a more cost-effective manner, and it's gonna be offered in a more reliable and performant, performant way. Further benefits, which we're also exploring and actually really, really excited about, is when we start integrating the various AWS services together within the larger ecosystem, you get a ton of bang for your buck. What we're finding is as we start to cobble these, these services together, they really become more than just the sum of their parts. Whether that be CloudFormation, whether it be SNS, SQS, whatever the case is, we find there's a ton of opportunity to help us not only build our environments better, manage them better, but also actually include those in the services we offer to our customers. The next thing we did was look at where we're logging our errors. And I'm gonna tell a little story. I was working on a problem a while ago with a colleague of mine, and we found that we were approaching it very differently. We we're trying to figure out why that is. I said, Adam, how are you gonna solve this? He said, I'm gonna script it in PowerShell. Stephen, how are you gonna solve it? I said, I'm gonna put it in SQL, I'm gonna run a database, and I'm gonna query it. And there was this aha moment where we realized none of us even, neither of us cared what the problem was. We were just using our favorite tool. We had hammers and everything was a nail. And that's a, common, that's a human thing. Everybody wants to use the tool they're most comfortable with. And it's a very dangerous thing. When you're headed up into AWS or any cloud vendor, you want to rethink what the best tool for the job is. Don't just use SQL because it's a thing you're most comfortable with. And the, the equivalent here is the cloud is not a magical hosting facility in the sky. You can't just lift everything and expect it to work the same way. And on the other hand, it's an opportunity. Once you have to make your stuff work in another place, think about whether your tooling is well designed for the problem you're trying to solve. And this is a case where it wasn't for us. So let's look at what it looked like before. So we had SQL as a logging database. SQL is great at a great many things. Text search, not among them. It was really annoying to search our logs. We really wanted to search our logs. We could only retain about 30 days of data, and the reason for that was it was too costly. That graph is terabytes on the bottom and costs on the other side. I am not telling you exactly how much it cost. It was a very big number. And we were hard-coded in how we had to shard that data or split that data. Because of how we were implementing it, we were fixed on where the data was distributed. It's just very costly, and it's the wrong solution. So when we're looking at heading up to AWS, what do they have? And so we looked around and tried to find something that would be good at search with efficient storage. Luckily enough, Amazon has a well-named service called Elasticsearch that turns out is pretty good at searching. 
We used Kinesis Firehose to point our logs up into an S3 bucket fronted by an Elasticsearch cluster. It's designed for search. We could look across a vast number of logs very efficiently and very quickly. We can retain 12 months of data instead of 30 days. We could actually retain more. We just haven't been running this for 12 months yet. We'll probably end up tossing it to Glacier or something like that. The only reason we say 12 months is because we've never needed an error log that's over a year old. I don't know about you, but a year later I'm over that 500. I've gotten past it. We're sharding by choice. We can split on a variety of fields in how Elasticsearch is going to let us configure that. And it's significantly cheaper. We also have lower minimums, which has come up before, which is convenient if you want to keep the data regional. The biggest lesson here really is don't use relational databases for non-relational data. But the broader generic picture of that is pick the right tool for the job and treat a lift up to the cloud as an opportunity to revisit what that right tool may be. So a few years ago, we made the decision to totally revamp our analytics platform from the ground up in order to further extend our lead in, in the edge analytics market. To get an idea of where and how we would actually host and deliver this platform from, and once we sort of had an understanding of what the technology components looked like and how they were all architect architected together, we ran a couple of scenarios. So the first one we ran was one that we were comfortable with and one that we were good at, which was let's do it ourselves. That meant hand rolling all those components on infrastructure within our own data centers. And the yellow line there in the graph shows that, that forecast. What immediately jumps out is that step function. As Stephen mentioned earlier, as soon as you see one of those, freak out. That means there's wastage. That's a firm indicator of that. In this case, as with the the example Stephen mentioned earlier, that was driven by us having to always um, you know, provide hardware for peak load. When you don't have elasticity or the, the ability to burst, that is just something you have to do. The second big driver to that is, was around making sure that we had sufficient headroom to account for, as Stephen mentioned, our long hardware purchasing and requisition times, as well as the way to get those implemented. The other thing that freaked us out was the high floor cost. This was, once again, driven, driven primarily by capital expenditure at actually establishing a presence of our platform in a given data center or in a given region. Initially, we certainly weren't very optimistic about that. Um, the intent is for our platform to be multi-region. So those costs multiplied by every single region obviously became a non-starter. So overall, we weren't very particularly excited about this. At this point in time, we did have a decent understanding of what public cloud was. We were familiar with this. So the second scenario we ran was in AWS. So taking the same parameters around product uptake and scaling, we looked at what it would cost to roll this in AWS. What immediately jumps out is we have a far shallower and gradual curve. That indicated to us that we'd eliminated a lot of that wastage, and we were very, very comfortable with that. The second thing to note is the floor cost. We had an almost zero floor cost. Obviously, that was fantastic. It means attacking new markets, very low barrier. Awesome. Very excited about that. What concerned us, however, was where that blue line and that orange line cross. That was a firm indicator that sometime in the future and at some scale, we would have to host our to this platform on our own gear. This is when the fear of lock-in grabbed us at that point in time. We now had a viable eventuality that we'd have to vacate AWS and run this on our own gear. So to mitigate this, we did some interesting stuff with the components. We ensured that we rolled them in such a way that they were totally abstracted from the underlying infrastructure to ensure that we could move that as and when the time came. So we ended up going with the AWS way, and we built into our plan to make sure we kept a close eye on the scaling, a close eye on the cost, and try to find that point in reality when they, when they actually crossed, and then we would pull it out of AWS, and host it on our own. So as you can probably guess, the next slide shows what actually happened. We rolled it our own. We decided to roll the, the platform with a distro, once again, further enabling us to have that portability. What immediately jumps out is, and that's the green, the green line, by the way. What immediately jumps out is the trajectory, trajectory was far shallower than what we initially thought. 
That was due to a number of factors, everything from our estimations weren't exactly what we thought they would be. Our costing was either too much in some cases, too little in other cases. Our ability to scale what is a very, very intricate and complex system wasn't as good as we thought it would be. So really a number of factors for that. The second one is the floor cost was actually a lot higher than we originally anticipated. The scale there diminishes it, but it was enough to actually be a major cause, a major cause of concern for actually running in multiple regions. So not very good. And that crossover point, it's not really there. Yes, it is there. It's way into the future, so it's not really part of the, the projections. And considering that time horizon, probably not as important as what we originally anticipated it would be. So looking back and reflecting, would we have done anything different? I'm not actually sure. I, I suspect not. I think what you're going to find is as you're trying to make these decisions, all these things are moving, moving beneath you. It's a constant moving target. And at some point in time, you have to commit and pull the trigger to it, trigger on it. I think the lesson perhaps here is if you do find yourself in the position where a fear of lock-in or this portability, this concept of portability, is driving major, major architectural decisions, drill deep into them. So what I mean by that is run more samples, run more variants of those samples, do tabletop exercises, do what-if analysis, do more prototyping. That's key. Prototyping is probably the best way to actually validate costs, validate your assumptions around scale, do all those things. So what does the future hold? So yeah, we are actively investigating and prototyping running our, our platform utilizing AWS data and analytics services. What is interesting here is obviously a far shallower curve, which we're really, really excited about. We have very close to zero floor cost. So once again, that's a massive differentiator for us as we look to establish our our platform in multiple regions. I can't underestimate that. That is a key, key, key market differentiator for us. Crossover point, well, yeah, that becomes kind of a joke. I, it's there somewhere. I can't see it, probably not in my lifetime. So with this data, we are far more comfortable adopting AWS services and the result in lock-in, understanding that the benefits we get far outweigh the cost. This makes us, this will make us faster. It will make us more cost effective and really will give us time and opportunity to focus on things that in the platform and in the analytics that actually make our students and our teachers more successful. It's important to note all the analysis we've done up until this point is just for the infrastructure, platform, and services costs. We haven't talked about R&D, we haven't talked about build costs, people costs, and we certainly haven't talked about the often dreaded and unquantifiable opportunity cost. So those four slides, took two years of a dev team. That's not just quite the past five minutes. Um, it's really hard to DevOps, and yeah, I use it as a verb, when you're responsible for a huge breadth of technologies. And the way to get around that is to delegate some of the responsibility. You want to delegate the scope of managing your Hadoop infrastructure to Amazon. You want to pick and choose your battles. And the reason for that is you don't want your devs attending training sessions on how to manage an intricate tool. They might be good at it, but we have better things for them to do. In our case, we want them developing tools that are going to identify at-risk students and help teachers reach out to those students to best enable them to graduate. We want them identifying tools that can help students pick courses that they're going to succeed in and still get their degree requirements. We want to figure out how we can best visualize a variety of metrics that help teachers determine the most effective manner that they're teaching, whether the students are following along or not. And none of those things are attending a training session on how to spin up a management node in a Hadoop cluster. We want Amazon to do that for us. Opportunity cost is kind of the thing I joke about. I want written on every wall of every building and every street sign everywhere. When anyone asks you, can you do this thing, the answer really isn't yes or no. The answer is, well, here's the thing I won't do if I am doing this other thing. So while we were managing our Hadoop infrastructure, that was less time to put towards extending our lead in the analytics space. Now, to be fair, some of the techs that we're looking at in the next little while didn't really exist two years ago. EMR today is significantly beyond where it was before. And as Stan mentioned, you have to be careful about those, that shifting ground under you. You want to work with your AWS rep or read their white papers and figure out what technology is there. And don't think about that as a detriment. That's the whole advantage to using this technology in the first place. That's the whole advantage of paying someone else to do parts of it for you 
is that you're developing your stuff and they keep developing their stuff, and you get the advantage of that. So one last main section that I wanna talk about is third-party pushback, because we've got a lot of hardware vendors, we've got uh, data centers all over the world, and they are not so much a fan of this cloud thing. I wonder why that could be. I've actually got a quote, if they, referring to Amazon, have a hiccup, they will be bankrupt. There's a major tech company's EMEA president. That's a scare tactic. I don't like scare tactics. I don't wanna be afraid of vendor lock-in. I wanna run numbers and decide when it's worth it and when it's not. And I wonder why they're trying to make me scared of the cloud. It's because they want my money and they don't want me to give my money to Amazon. It's important in, well, life, but also cloud decisions, to think about the motivations of the people giving you advice. One of my favorite salesperson experiences is when I walk into a store and say, I need these two products, and the person says, well, this one's in aisle three, and that one you should go to our competitor down the road. Because if somebody's willing to tell me that, I'm willing to believe them about other stuff they say. One of the things I used to be involved in that I'm happily no longer involved in is RFP calls or pre-sales calls. I'd get called in as the technical expert, and my favorite part of it was watching the account manager's face or the salesperson's face when I said no to a client. And invariably afterwards, they would pull me inside and say, you know, we don't say no to clients. We say maybe, or we say we'll look into it. And I said no. The reason they want me on the call is because sometimes I say no, which is why they believe me when I say yes, which is why they don't believe you when you say yes. It's actually one of the things I really like about our AWS reps, one of whom is sitting here and I'll talk a little bit later. They sometimes tell us, no, this is not the right product for you, or you should wait six months. It's not ready yet. It's available, but maybe for your use case, you should wait. They care more about the customer experience than the bill. They care more about their long-term relationship with us than how much money we're gonna fork over in the short term. And one of the things I found dealing with hardware vendors is they appear to care a lot more about the short-term bill rather than my long-term success. Understand the motivations of the person trying to convince you of something. It's really important in this and in all things. And one other thing about that, about that Amazon micro bankrupt thing, so we had some fun and we pulled the top five companies by market cap as of 2016 Q3. That's Apple, that's Alphabet, you might think of as Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. And what's interesting about these five is that they're all cloud companies. Apple is maybe, but they have a cloud play, so I'll include it because it makes the story better. Don't let your facts get in the way of my story. So I think this cloud thing might make it. I think maybe the industry has accepted that there's a lot of money in it. And I'm not worried that suddenly tomorrow every cloud vendor is going to disappear and I'm gonna be crawling back to my hardware vendor saying, please save me. <laughs> so let's recap a little. Who's afraid of EC2? If you're from Toronto, nobody. It's bad boy in the last bin. If you're not from Toronto, don't worry, we're Canadian. We have humor like that. So why aren't we afraid of EC2? We're not afraid of EC2 because we're used to it. We paid this price. We fought over physical servers and virtual servers and EC2 is just natural at this point. We need to feel like everything else is going ahead in that same path. Being afraid of EC2 is like being afraid of electricity when you're a candle maker. Like maybe it's time to get on board. Don't forget to account for all your costs. Vendor lock-in is time bound. There is a time horizon and you can run the numbers or find someone like me to run the numbers and determine if it's a good trade. You're not talking about locking up your data for all time. You're talking about as long as I did it for this long, it was a good deal and watch out for those little side costs, like, oh yeah, but we have to attend this training session. Oh yeah, but we have to write, you know, spend a sprint or two writing a tool that's gonna help us get our non-cloud tech shoehorned in. Yeah, please unroll your own DNS or, or caching, caching environments. Yes, you probably will, but make sure it's on your roadmap to, to adopt those services. Anything ancillary to your main services, those are no-brainers to just adopt, except the lock-in, and get you focused on, on more important things. There's nothing more effective than having you know, lots of people doing as few things as often as possible. Awesome things happen from that. If it helps, establish some guidelines, establish some principles just to help you and your business make, make smart decisions around that. A cloud is not a magical fairy castle in the sky. You cannot treat it the same as your own hosting environment. And if you do, you will pay the price. Use it as an opportunity to reevaluate. Platform as a service is always better than infrastructure as a service. Yes, adopting platforms, majority of the time is better, and yes, it does mean adopting something, and yes, it's gonna be lock-in. But before you get too excited, understand that lock-in. Actually, determine the cost of it. Work out the probability of the chance, of what the probability is that you'll actually spend that lock-in. 
and then compare that to the benefits you get, often straight away. So weave into your analysis, weave in time horizons, and weave in opportunity cost. And it's better for nothing, no other reason than you get to say pass instead of I ass. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, this AWS thing might stick around for a bit. I, I think we're pretty safe that the cloud as a system is going to exist. And that's a pretty good segue to introduce Ben Snively, who is one of the solution architects that we've had a lot of success working with, um, and who helps us with figuring out how to migrate our stuff up into the magical sky. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, so my name is Ben Snively. I'm a solutions architect for AWS. I've really had the really rewarding opportunity to work with D2L really changing the way education is done, really fantastic customer. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk, to talk to the audience a little bit about some of the services and features that allow you to really do that migration from on-premises into AWS. Uh, Andy Jesse was talking some this morning about some of these. Uh, we're gonna dive deeper into uh, many of them today. So first off, when you're, when you're running things on-premises, you have local networks, and there's various resources on those local networks. And there's a need to be able to extend that lo no local network into AWS. So within AWS, you could do uh, something called create uh, one VPC or multiple VPCs, virtual private clouds, to really create isolated network spaces for yourself as a customer, completely isolated from other customers. Why this is important is it really lets you extend your local network into AWS and, and have services on both ends to be able to talk to each other. The way that extension happens is either through a Direct Connect or a VPN. Uh, direct Connect allows you to mul connect multiple VPCs uh, back, on, back to your data center if, if you'd like. Access control, very, very critical. You know, uh, there's different folks in your organization that need to be able to launch resources. Some of those resources might be in the dev environment, other uh, may be in the prod environment. Identity and access management has that fine-grained access control. This morning, we were talking about being able to control not only the time, but the place and exactly what database engine to run with specific IOPS. Very, very fine-grained access control. And what that allows you to do is have that fine-grained access control, but also integrate it with the identity and access management software you're running on-premises. So you could do things like single sign-on using SAML and then map those assertions of particular permissions into AWS to be able to control through one identity management system uh, access to both on-premises resources as well as AWS resources. Being able to extend your, your storage into AWS, so we're gonna dive into this more uh, in a couple slides, uh, but you know, storage is part of the gravity of the system. You know, every, every system I, I've really talked to folks about, there's a storage component. So there's multiple ways to actually get that storage out into AWS to be able to have that uh, migration and, and hybrid architecture. And of course, integrated management. Uh, it's key to be able to have single planes of glass and see resources both in AWS as well as on-premises when you're running hybrid environments. So every customer uh, I think I've ever talked to had storage requirements, but many of them differ. So some, some customers have large, large storage footprints and they're like looking to take that story to move it to uh, AWS. Uh, I think everyone saw the semi rolling in this morning. Pretty cool. Uh, Digital Globe is one customer that used that. You know, we highlight that in the blog post if you go to uh, the What's New blog post uh, after uh, Andy's discussion. So, you know, that's a great example where there's a massive amount of data that needed to get moved to AWS. Other customers have flowing data. So think of IoT sensors, telemetry data that all needs to be collected and brought into AWS for, for the solutions to be built. And many, many other use cases depending on your, your data heuristics. So there's really this uh, platform of services to be able to help with that data migration or data transfer into AWS. Uh, there's Direct Connect, uh, which really gives you a dedicated connection to AWS. That dedicated connection could be used both for private IP addressing within your VPCs as well as accessing public IPs within uh, various endpoints in AWS. There's Snowball and Snowball Edge uh, and Snowmobile, I should list that on there, uh, to be able to do that massive uh, migration of large data sets, you know, petabyte scales, exabyte scales, uh, data migration into AWS. And ISV connectors uh, to be able to natively talk to, to the storage tier. Uh, Amazon uh, Kinesis Firehose, uh, this is one of the three services that uh, make up Amazon Kinesis. And Firehose specifically is, is meant to take streaming data. So when we're talking about streaming data, we're really talking about high velocity events coming into your system 
This could be from log data, it could be from sensors out in the wild, or it could be uh, other types of uh, uh, constantly generated data uh, out, out in the enterprise. What Amazon Firehose, uh, Kinesis Firehose does is it's a fully managed service, so you don't have to worry about uh, growing based on your, your demands as you have more events come in. And you define this Firehose, you give it a destination, and that service will, is fully managed where it'll grow and shrink based on your demands. When you de define your destination, you could define it as a S3 endpoint. You could uh, define it as Elasticsearch to be able to easily do things like search log data. Or you could define it as Redshift in order to run business analytics and, and use various BI tools on top of it. And uh, S3 transfer acceleration, what this is, is really meant to be able to get data into AWS where the data is getting transferred uh, from a large geospatial distance uh, from where you, the region you want to transfer it to. Uh, what happens is that it's actually using all those edge locations to be able to talk to the edge location first and then go through that edge location to transfer it into that particular region. Um, very, very powerful if you have uh, content uh, creators around the world that need to get your data into AWS. Um, there's a small fee for this, but if there's actually no acceleration, the fee's waived. Uh, so very, very powerful uh, for that use case. And then uh, storage gateway. So we have the AWS storage gateway. Uh, we recently announced a new version called file gateway of that, where it actually uh, presents an NSF uh, front end to the storage gateway. Uh, but also really, really great partners like NetApp and Commvault and uh, these partners that provide the storage gateway appliances uh, to be able to have uh, storage in the cloud uh, presented back on premises. In addition to storage, you know, there's databases and uh, database migration is really hard. You know, in a traditional methodology, oftentimes that requires databases to be frozen, uh, you know, systems to have a, a small outage, maintenance windows, very, very really challenging to move databases uh, large distances. The database migration service, really, really easy to get started. You can get started in minutes. Uh, you could actually uh, set a source and destination uh, either on premises, uh, a relational database on EC2, uh, Amazon RDS, or uh, Amazon Redshift to be able to migrate to and from those various sources. <clears throat> Really, another powerful feature is being able to leverage the schema conversion tool. Uh, the schema conversion tool lets you uh, actually migrate database engines. What that does is you, you, set, you run the tool, you give it the source uh, schema or the source database engine, you tell it where you're migrating it to, and it will analyze and figure out what it could automatically migrate. And then various things are actually tagged for manual migration. Works really, really great uh, for many use cases. If there's tons and tons of stored procedures, then you know, oftentimes a lot of that is tagged as manual, uh, depending on what's in the stored procedure. So, one of the last ones uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, is the AWS Application Discovery Service. So this is really great when you have large applications running in data centers or uh, various locations and. What you need to do is uh, you want to put together a migration plan. Part of that migration plan is first understanding what applications are out there, uh, and then also what are the dependencies of those applications. So the AWS Application Discovery Service, what it does is it helps automate that process. It runs, it figures out the various applications, and creates a application inventory uh, for you as a customer. Uh, within that application inventory, it has those mappings of the dependencies as well as some baseline performance information to give you some perspective of various instances that uh, that might map to. Uh, should caveat, you know, this is uh, a really great process uh, for folks that are looking at lift and shift, but, you know, making applications really for that cloud optimized would, would be really good uh, methodology for the mission critical systems. So definitely, you know, when you could refactor and make uh, applications cloud optimized, um, leverage elasticity, that sort of thing, it's very, very powerful. And then the last one to talk to you guys about is the AWS Server uh, Migration Service, or SMS. Um, I'll talk a little bit about VMware uh, Cloud for AWS, because very, very excited about that service as well. This is a, a different service uh, that's uh, provided uh, within the AWS suite. Uh, but the server migration service, what that does is that it really allows you to run a component on your VMware. 
That component uh, uh, runs uh, within VMware uh, and allows you to really group various VMs together uh, into logical groups. Those could be based on various applications you discovered in the previous step. And what that allows you to do is then take those groups of applications or groups of VMs and migrate them as AMIs or AMIs uh, into AWS. And what that allows you to do now is when, there, when it's an AMI, you could very, very easily launch it as an EC2 instance. Or you could uh, copy that AMI from one region to another region uh, if you wanted to then replicate that elsewhere. It also supports incremental changes. Uh, so you, know, you could take the first snapshot uh, as well as uh, be able to then incrementally take changes as you're doing that migration. So that, that's really powerful uh, because it will limit uh, or reduce the amount of downtime you may need to take as you're looking at migrating these various VMs. So the, those were just a few. Uh, there's many, many other services that really help in that hybrid architecture and, and being able to support workloads that span on-premises and uh, within AWS but wanted to just give a, a small overview of some of the most common ones that we see. So um, from there, uh, I definitely want to thank you know, the DTOL team for, uh, for presenting, but also wanted to um, see if there's uh, any questions.